You are listening to Let's Get Metaphysical. This podcast explores the spiritual and metaphysical world through the experiences and opinions of the host and those interviewed. It should not necessarily be seen as direct endorsement or personal advice to our listeners. We encourage you to use your own discernment, judgment, and intuition regarding anything you learn from this show. Let's get meta. Welcome to Let's Get Metaphysical. I'm your host, Renata Maniachi, here to say, we're all in this together. And did you know that you can have healing work done no matter where you are in the world? That is something to smile about. This is season four, our season of miracles. And this is episode 46, which is all about remote healing miracles meaning healing happening without the healing facilitator being physically present with the person needing healing. I am devoting this whole season to one special person and to the community his miracles and teachings have benefited. His name is Master John Douglas, and he is one of the greatest distant or remote healers on the planet today. In the first episode of this season, episode 37, I gave a more thorough intro into who Master John Douglas is, how I became acquainted with his work, and some terms that are going to be used throughout this season. If you have not listened to that episode yet, I encourage you to do so before listening in to this one. In this episode, you will hear several miracles attributed to Master John Douglas and the Master Healing Angels that all occurred through remote healing meaning Master John was asked to help healing in some way, and healing miracles happened even though Master John was not physically present with the person needing help. You will hear about two types of remote healing tools folks can use to get Master John's immediate attention. One is called a Silent Faith Remote Healing, known as an SFR, and the other is called a Karmic Mitigation Blessing and is known as a KMB. These are both options for people to purchase on the CMA website, masterangels.org. If in need of immediate healing support from Master John, no matter where he is in the world. Some of the following miracles occurred as a result of SFRs or KMBs. There were some unavoidable background noises in some of these interviews. I apologize for that. I was recording these interviews all throughout Master John's 2019 fall tour, and there were different sound challenges in each place. So without further ado, let's jump into these remote healing miracles. Are you ready? Let's get miraculous. Now this first incredible remote healing story is one of my favorites, and it is a true miracle that happened to one of the most successful lawyers in the United States, Jeffrey Wagner. Jeffrey is a self-proclaimed hard-charging lawyer and recovering left-brainaholic. He calls himself very left-brained, very focused on linear logic, who tries cases all over the country and the world. And that was his main focus, up until fairly recently. In November 2016, a few months after he and his wife Deborah had taken their first advanced development course with Master John Douglas, also known as the Elite Development Course, Jeffrey suffered a massive heart attack while in a remote village in Alaska. Jeffrey's son Gabriel plays an integral role in this story, and it's important to know that Gabriel also happens to be Master John's protege and travels with Master John while he is in the United States. Here is Jeffrey with the story. Please excuse the first few seconds as there was a Master John process finishing up in the background while I was recording. I was in the lower Yukon in Alaska in a small town called Bethel, which the, the Bethel metropolitan community, if you will, which is sort of a small, poor town surrounded by uh, Native American uh, villages. The whole metropolitan area is maybe five or 6,000 people. It's very poor. Uh, there's no hospital. There's a health center. There is a high school. And, um, but it's pretty remote. It's 400 miles west of Anchorage. And uh, surrounded by water. So there's really nowhere to go 
And we had a large trial there that we had to do. So I was there for six, eight weeks or something like that. I was there for a long time. And we did the whole trial uh, and we were finishing up. It was the last day we finished examining and cross-examining witnesses. We stayed late to make sure we handled everything with the judge with arguing about whether this piece of evidence or that piece of evidence was admissible or not admissible, doing the things that lawyers do. So we worked a little late that day to make sure that the case was ready the next day for closing arguments before the jury. The case had been going on at trial for about five or six weeks, I think, at that point. And so I was finished because my trial partner, Stan, was going to do the closing argument for us the next day. So I really was finished. And I went back to our little office suite that we'd rented uh, a few sort of offices above the Subway sandwich shop, which was the only fast food of a national chain that was in Bethel. And I noticed when I got back to the office that my left arm around the bicep kind of hurt and it felt like a pulled muscle. It reminded me of how my arm felt when I was in Little League and I pitched too much and I pulled a muscle and that's what it felt like. And I didn't know what it was. And the, uh, the team's secretary asked if I wanted to go to the health center. I said, no, not for this. I probably just put my book bag on wrong or something. I, never mind. And I went back into my little office and I just started cleaning up because I was done and I was really going to get ready for cocktail hour more than anything else. And then my chest started to hurt and it was, it was kind of like there was a rock in there, but it was burning and pushing and pulling all at once. And it started radiating towards my left arm. And I kind of knew or had a feeling this is a sure sign of, of a heart attack, but I said, no, this can't be. And I denied it in my own head. And we finished cleaning up, putting everything together, and it just kept hurting more and more and more. So I sort of held my left arm with my right hand. I pulled it across my chest and sat down at my desk and I just put my head down. And I didn't want to bother anybody because they're preparing Stan was preparing for his closing argument. I didn't want to get in the way of anybody. And everybody else was going off to dinner. And I thought, I'll just sit quietly and maybe it'll pass. But it just kept getting worse and worse. And I think I was a little bit in and out of consciousness. The next thing I remember was uh, Stan going down the hallway. And he said, hey, Jeff, we would always just say hello as we passed each other's offices. And then I remember him next to me with his hand on my back. And apparently what happened was he noticed I didn't answer him. So he came back in the office. He saw my head down and he came right up next to me, put his hand on my back. And he said, I asked you how you are. And I remember not picking my head up, but just saying to him, Stan, this really hurts. Uh, and he asked me what hurt. And, and I described everything to him and he ran into the hallway and he said, cause we had a whole team there and there were five or six people around. And he said, this is not a drill. We need to find an ambulance. This could be a heart attack. So my partner, Jeff Michael, apparently called 911. And that's when we learned the town is so small. It doesn't even have 911 service. But the town is so small, there's only one paved road. And so uh, one person called the fire department, one person called the health center, one person called the police, and one just went running out the door because the fire station is two doors down, maybe a half a mile, and just, we got to find the ambulance. So the ambulance came uh, and... Uh, uh, the care was was fine. They were on the phone right away with Anchorage, which has full heart surgery facilities. They were kind of running the show, but uh, we got me to loaded up into an ambulance and hooked up to heart monitors and things and took me to the health center where they had to check whether or not I was having a heart attack or suffering from an aortic tear because you treat those two things differently. If it's an aortic tear and you 
and it gets treated with clot busting drugs, then the patient bleeds out and dies. We don't want that. <laughs> so right. I said, yes, let's find out if it's this a heart attack or not. And they said, we do have an MRI machine here or a CT scan. And uh, so they said, we'll, we'll take you to the CT and we'll, we'll check this out. Good idea. So I remember being wheeled into the room with the CT scan. And as they were putting me in that tube, I remember with my right hand touching the side of it and saying just silently to myself, Master John, I know you have the whole world to look after, but if you have a moment, I could really use a hand here. As it turns out, right at that moment, Deborah was home. And one of my young associates who was with us on the trial team had called our office manager in Chicago who had tried to reach Deborah to let her know that I'd been taken to uh, the health center. And Deborah saw the name pop up on the screen and ignored it because it was a name she didn't recognize. And she'd come home late from work that day. And it was three hours ahead already. It was like 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. And she just really wanted to watch a little television and sort of settle down for the night. She'd been working full time and helping on election matters because the presidential election was the next day. And she just didn't want to be bothered anymore. But Raquel, the office manager, kept calling. So Deborah looked at her phone and sees there's also emails from this woman named Raquel Gonzalez. And she says, I guess I better call and answer. And so Deborah talked to Raquel and told her what was going on, that I'd been taken to the town health center ER emergency place. We weren't sure what was going on. It was something with my heart and told her to call my colleague who was there with me to give her the information. Uh, Tabra said, thank you, and did not call my colleague. She called our son, Gabriel, who was John's right-hand man, and, uh, and he was with John. John was in Chicago at the time because they just started the tour, and they were in Chicago. They were at, I think, a fast food, maybe a Five Guys, or they were at a restaurant or something. They were eating dinner, and Gabriel does not like to answer the phone when he has time alone with Master John. But Deborah called him, his phone rang, Pastor John heard the phone ring, looked at Gabriel and said, you really ought to answer that one. And so Gabriel answered the phone and it was Deborah saying, I don't know what's going on. I just got this call from Jeff's office manager. Uh, he, he says his chest hurts, it's this. And she said she immediately heard John uh, checking in on me. But that call and me asking for John's help we put the timeline together, happened at exactly the same moment. Wow. And so John immediately was on it, located the clot that was in my left anterior descending artery that was, it was completely blocked. He moved it so that the blood could flow. Um, and I started to feel better out in Alaska. So it was a remote healing, which John can do now. And uh, it was fascinating because after I got out of the CT scan and they told me it is a heart attack, we'll start to treat you with the medicines, the clot busting drugs. They hooked me up. It was an IV and I was starting to feel better. And I was in the room and I got Deborah on the phone. I wanted to talk to her, let her know, here I am. This is what's going on. I was going to just try and let her know that I should calm her down. Uh, and she heard this on the phone. I said, is it raining in here? And the doctors and nurses, because there were a lot of people around, said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm feeling all this splashing on my left shoulder. I don't understand. And then there were these gasps in the room. As it turned out, the valve on the IV was broken. No medicine was getting in me. So the clot moved and the heart attack was resolving with no medicine. It was Master John Douglas who had moved the clot and allowed the blood to flow so that I could survive. And he told Gabriel and Deborah that the problem was in the left ventricle. So Deborah, um, I had her on the phone and she wanted to give me the message that Master John was on it, working on it, helping. So she said, 
I was trying to tell her everything's going to be okay. I'm starting to feel better. And she's like, stop talking. I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. She said, the problem's in your left ventricle. But, you know, it, it's being taken care of. And that was her signal to me that Master John was on it. The doctor, the attending was there and he broke into the conversation. He said, ma'am, hold on. She said, what? He said, how do you know it's in the left ventricle? We can't know that until we go in in an angiogram. And our goal here is to get them stabled so we can fly them to Anchorage. We, how, is there, how do you know? And Deborah, she said, she said, doctor, I'm sure you are wonderful. Thank you for taking care of my husband. But you are trained in Western medicine. And frankly, I don't have time to explain this to you. It's in his left ventricle. <laughs> it's just, okay. Uh, but that was the point. The point was to get me stable so that they could airlift me to Anchorage where they have heart surgery facilities so that they could go and see what was wrong, see if I needed bypass surgery, see if I needed stents or whatever. And, and I was just, okay, fine. Cause they were also giving me some medicines to what I was kind of loopy uh, and, and goofing around at that point. And Deborah had the brains to ask, how's the weather? I mean, it's Alaska and it's early November and it was, they said, it's really cold, but there's no snow. Planes are flying. It'll be fine. So ultimately we got me stabilized, um, got me airlifted to Anchorage. Uh, and I was first one in line in the morning for when the heart surgeon came in and they went in and they looked at the angiogram. Sure enough, the clot was in the left anterior descending artery. Uh, they put in a couple of stents, uh, and off I went. Um, and it was, so it, it, it was great experience. I had John take care of me and that was a major miracle. And it was the, there's an epilogue to this whole story. Um, I don't know if I'm telling it as fully as I, I've told it in the past because I forget stuff now. But one of the things that happened is that when I was kind of in and out and down and the blood flow and the oxygen were getting to the brain, it impacted my brain chemistry. So after I got home, the, I was ex really, really fatigued all the time. And I couldn't shake it. And at first, the doctors were telling me, well, you just had a heart attack. It's a significant heart attack. It's called the Widowmaker. Only 6% of people apparently survived this heart attack. So I'm one of the very lucky few. They said, just let it be for a while. But it, it didn't get better and didn't get better and didn't get better. And so we started to do some further exploration, including a series of sleep studies. And it turned out that although it's uncommon, it happened to me that when my brain was deprived of blood and oxygen that it needed, the chemistry got messed up and now I have narcolepsy. So, which has affected cognition and uh, just, it, it really affects my day. I, I can't function the way I used to function, which is really a blessing because this whole episode of the heart attack and the narcolepsy forced me to change completely who I am and how I run my life. And I refer to it now as my great cosmic kick in the pants. And they said, that was fine for the first 54 years. And now you're going to do something else. And it allowed me to really devote myself to all of the things that Master John is trying to teach us and convey to us all of the blessings he's bestowing on us and to spend as much time as I possibly can attending to whatever Master John needs to expand and grow and complete his mission on earth. Um, so can I still work a little bit? I can't do what I was doing. I can't try cases anymore. I can't stay awake long enough and it's, it would be bad to fall asleep in front of juries. But I can help. I, I do a little bit of client work, help them with strategic advice and that a couple of hours every morning. And that's about it. And I spend as much time as I can now trying to help Master John, trying to help Gabriel, trying to help CMA International to expand, to grow, to bring people to John. Did you find that you had any shifts in personality before and after your, your event? Much. It's... 
I would characterize myself prior to the event as sort of a typical kind of, you know, professional focused on my work, almost to the exclusion of everything else. Uh, that, that's the way I functioned is that uh, I, I had climbed to a certain level in the profession. So I was the lead trial lawyer for cases. And uh, the client I was doing the most work for has thousands of cases that need to be tried. And so there are squadrons of teams that get the cases ready for trial. And then a few months before a trial, they select a trial counsel. There were only 10 or 12 of us that were doing this. And so we had three, four months to completely memorize the case, learn it all, get ready, and try the case, which is with fact witnesses, expert witnesses, jury instructions, picking a jury, openings, closing. It's, it's a lot. And you'd have to do it in a very intense three to four month period and then move on to the next one. I can't do that anymore. Uh, it's just my mind doesn't work that way anymore after this event. Um, so I was forced medically to change how I was approaching things, but also then by spending the amount of time with John's tools, uh, with subconscious repair and soul repair and spirit repair, um, as well as some of his other advanced ones, everything changed. Um, and so I've learned much more about seeing things from multiple angles, about patience, about not reacting in the moment, about watching how I used to react and saying that really wasn't proper. I need to make sure that I change myself. And so I don't know if I softer might be one way of characterizing it, but it's I'm, I'm definitely more patient. I'm more understanding, and I find myself actively trying to see things from other people's points of view before I react, and that's a definite change in the way I would approach things. It was more, I've seen this, I know this, just do it my way, get out of the way. I don't do that anymore, or I really try not to. I've so, never known you to do anything yeah, like this. So it's a big change. <laughs> for me, that's a big change. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I just had one more quick question for you. As many as you like. Did you believe in miracles before all of this? I think I did at some level, but it wasn't very conscious or tangible. And now it's really tangible. Now I know I've experienced a miracle and I, I just, I believe and know it's not just it's not just belief like I believe there are angels. It's I know that there are seen and unseen entities and beings on earth here helping us. Um, and that makes a big difference in my daily life. Um, so thank you. Sure. Hi, my name's Debbie, and I wanted to just share with you the story of my grandniece who was born 14 weeks premature at one pound, 10 ounces. And it's my sister's grandbaby, so she called me up and she told me that her you know, son's girlfriend had the baby. And so I immediately did a silent faith remote for the baby and for the mother too, because the mother's life was at risk. So after I did that, you know, I expected a lot of complications because I have a good friend who's a NICU nurse, and she said, just expect two steps forward and three steps backwards for months and maybe even years. So we went through the months, and the baby just grew, and there were no complications, and she actually had nothing wrong with her at all. And she went through the whole hospital stay of 90 days in the NICU, and she came home the day after her due date, which is the day she normally would have come home had she been born on the right date. And she had no complications whatsoever. And she's now 18 months old, and she has no eye problems, no lung problems, no ear problems, which are very, very common for preemies. 
and I was talking to my sister on the phone the other day, and she said, I can't believe I can't get Presley to stop climbing on things. She's climbing on the chair and onto the cabinet. She said if she could climb on the roof, she would. So she's just a happy, healthy, normal 18-month-old with no deficits whatsoever. And I attribute that all to Master John and the Silent Faith Remote Healing that I did for her. Hello, I, I'm Brian. And Millie. Just want to talk a little bit about my sisters. Unfortunately, I had two sisters that passed this year. And they were, my first sister was Nancy. She was 67. And she was just getting ready to retire from her job. And she'd been having health problems, but she didn't take the time to go to the doctor to check out what was going on. And by the time she went to the doctor, she found out she had stage four esophageal cancer. So she was not able to get treatment in time uh, and she was failing very quickly. Uh, when we found out about it, the prognosis was that she was not going to be able to, to make it really beyond just a few days. We were, we heard about this and we, wanted to go see her, talk to her and, and say goodbye and hopefully give her some comfort. We decided to do. She hadn't been in touch with the family or we would have done something sooner to just to mention that. Right. She was so in, just into what she was going through and her, everything else going on in her life. So we did a karmic mitigation blessing to hopefully help her with whatever karmic issues that she was trying to, to, go through herself as well. Yes, go ahead. Can you talk about what a karmic mitigation blessing is a little bit? Sure. Why don't you talk about that? Okay. A karmic mitigation blessing is when John works on your a person's karma, and it could be in this lifetime or in any lifetime, and he mitigates it with the master angels, and he makes it easier for you in this lifetime and in every lifetime. So our goal was to make her passing easier, her life more worthwhile, and her next life easier. Thank you. That's a great description. It is, yes. So we, we did that for Nancy, and I was able to go see her that weekend following the karmic mitigation blessing. At this point, from what we had heard from our my siblings who were seeing her as well as her son, was that she was very uncommunicative and kind of just in and out of twilight kind of thing, you know, going through her illness. So I went to see her and she actually started improving while I was there talking to her. And, and she was very involved in a conversation with me. Everybody left the room and it's just me and her talking for probably an hour or so and reminiscing and talking about what her plans were that, you know, it's not going to happen anymore. She realized that she was failing quickly and, and it was just a, a really good thing that I could go there and share that moment in time with her. And I feel like if it wasn't for the karmic mitigation blessing, I don't know that I would have had the time with her that was significant the way it was. And I'm sure that with doing the KMB is what we call it. I'm sure with the KMB, it also helped her in her transition into her next lifetime and, uh, and her family. And, and she has one child. So we're hoping we're, that will help him as well. Right. And, and we're, we're sure it will. And mm -hmm. so Towards the end of the day, when I was talking to her, you know, the family came back in and we, we shared some more, you know, all of us together. And after when I was leaving, I was talking to her son, who's in his 30s, and he was saying that uh, he thanked me for, for coming and said that he hadn't seen his mom, you know, that awake and communicative in weeks or months. Then about three days later, I found out she passed. Mm -hmm. Which was really a blessing because of all the pain she was in and, and the medication that she had to have for the pain. Mm -hmm. So it was a blessing that she went quickly. It could have extended for a few more months maybe sure. and and awful. So that was great. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was 
I mean, I'm very thankful for the time that I had with her, even though it was minimal. Um, it was nice. And, you know, it really, you see something, or I saw something in her that, that made me feel like she was getting the benefit from, from John's blessings, from the angel's blessings. Hi, my name's Glenn. My grandson was about one or two years old and he had ringworm and my daughter took him to the doctors and the doctor pres prescribed some medication and said that it's very difficult to get rid of it. It would take quite some time before he was free from ringworm. My daughter called me and told me about it and I did a silent faith remote and she called me the next day and said, boom, no more ringworm. Oh, so wow. overnight it was gone. That just happened right overnight. Wow. Did you, I have one more question for you. Did you believe in miracles before entering this community with Pastor John? You know, I guess I never really thought about it that much, but it's, you know, it's hard not to believe in them now. So Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. My name is Amy, and the miracle came from a silent faith remote that I requested for a severe concussion. How did you get your concussion? Oh, I banged my head really hard. Oh, man. I didn't think much about it. And then a day or two later, I was in bed, and a really severe headache came on. And then I realized the severity of the concussion. I didn't know whether I should go to the ER or what to do. Right. So I sort of tried to let it go but it was too strong to sleep. It was very severe. And I ended up calling a friend and asking her opinion whether I should go to ER or stay home. And her advice was, well, I don't want to advise you because if I say don't go to ER and something terrible happens, right. I feel responsible. Of course. And if I say go to ER and you sit for three hours and nothing's wrong, I'd feel pretty bad about that. She said, well, why don't you do a silent faith remote with John Douglas and see how that goes? And if you don't feel better, then go to ER. So I got on the computer at a quarter of 11 at night and entered the silent faith remote and let go and went back to bed and to see if it improved. And within 10 minutes, the pain had completely subsided, and I fell asleep. Already within 10 minutes? Yes. Wow. And did, were you able to heal from that concussion? It took time to fully heal, mm -hmm. but the acute pain had subsided. Wow. Thank you for sharing. My pleasure. Hi, my name is Melissa, and I want to share a miracle from a Silent Faith remote healing that I requested for a friend of mine. So the details are that on the morning of March 5th, my friend received a call that his cousin Joey had had a heart attack and was in a coma. I did an SFR, Silent Faith Remote, request within an hour. And that evening we were told that they would try to wake him up in two days. At this point, Joey's sister told us that prayers do work. She had no idea that we had done a Silent Faith remote healing prayer for him. So anyway, the very next morning, Joey woke up. Two days later, he went home from the hospital, and his sister told us that the doctor said it was a miracle. Wow. There are no words to express our deep gratitude for this life-saving miracle. Just the fact we had access to the SFR at the touch of a button is a miracle and gift beyond measure. Hi, my name is Melissa, and I wanted to share a few amazing things that have happened to me out of working with Master John Douglas. Uh, the first one was from a teleseminar that I was on. And when you're on a teleseminar, you can make requests for certain types of healings that you want. When I made my request, it was for something that emo was emotionally going on with me, but the miracle that I ended up getting while I was on the teleseminar, even without the request, was 
I had been having really bad back pain for probably about a month. And the middle of my back was really, really tight. And I'd been doing a lot of different stretches and nothing seemed to be working. And when I was on the teleseminar, I started to feel a warmness at the base or the top of my neck. And it gently started to go down my spine and it started releasing all of the tension that was in my back and releasing the tension in the spot that had been the tightest and went down to the base of my spine. And I had been planning to go to the chiropractor, but of course, after that, I had no need to do that. And that was one of the amazing things that I got and I hadn't even requested it. That's amazing. Yes. The second thing that I wanted to share uh, from a silent faith remote healing request, the first one that I had made was during a vacation that I had had on Martha's Vineyard. And every night about three in the morning, I was waking up with severe pain around my rib cage and couldn't lay on my back, couldn't lay on my front. I had to lay on my side and kind of put my weight on my other hand to kind of hold myself up. And I had been considering going to, you know, the ER, but I wasn't really sure what if my health insurance would cover right. it. And I had events that I was attending while I was there during the day. So I was going back and forth whether I should go. And then I had connected with one of my friends and she said, why don't you do a silent faith remote from Master John? And I kept considering it. And then on the last night that I was there, I had such pain. I was almost in tears. So it's like 2.30 in the morning. I finally did the silent faith remote healing. And I noticed uh, shortly thereafter, the, the pain started to subside. And as I had been sharing with people the symptoms that I had, two different people said to me, it sounds like you have gallstones because I had had them. And one of the uh, people had said that it had taken her three years to get properly diagnosed. She had been going through the pain. So by the time I got back to my hometown, I set up a doctor's appointment, but the pain had gone away. And by the time I got to in to see the doctor, there was no signs of anything. They could not could oh, not wow. find anything and it never came back. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Kathy. Uh, I wanted to tell you about a miracle with Master John that's a little different from the normal miracles. My son was in an accident. And as you know, Master John, he spreads his net of protection over our entire family. And we don't know how big that family is, but over our whole family. So when I heard my son was in an accident, it was actually here. I became comatose. I didn't know what to do. We here on the mountain. Here, right on the mountain. We went in and looked for Master John. He was at lunch. Chris called him. He pulled over to the side of the road and instantly started scanning and working on my son. And then by the time he came in, he told us that, my son had mostly soft tissue problems from the accident. He said that he did a brain scan. His brain was fine. The rest of his body was fine. He started working on my son so that he wouldn't get blood clots, so that he wouldn't get infections because he was, uh, his car hit a guardrail and it went right up through his mouth, missed his teeth, hit his nose, pushed his nose to the side, went across his carotid artery, And they had 16 stitches across his artery, went from one edge of his eye to the outside, never touched anything vital. And Master John said, he's going to be okay. So right when he said that, I totally relaxed. I knew Master John was in control of all of it. And it was interesting, too, because there was a plastic surgeon on duty, which is quite rare, because my son was already in emergency, which I didn't even know. And so an hour and a half later, we got a message from one of his friends. And she said, uh, it's the doctor said that it was a soft tissue injury. They did a brain scan. His brain was fine. 
There was no internal damage that the plastic surgeon was there, that he had fixed him up, that he had straightened his nose and that he was going to be okay. It was almost word for word what Master John said. Wow. And we have the time of getting a hold of Master John and we have the time of having the doctor speak. And it was an hour and a half difference and the results were exactly the same. And my son went home the next morning after this kind of trauma and uh, he was up working and doing things in, in 10 days wow. and he's recovered fully. But, you know, I thank Master John every day for what he does for my family. And uh, I know he was watching over my son. His protection goes all throughout our family. So I couldn't be more grateful. How incredible that you yeah. were, you were happened to be in the same place as it Master was, John. It was crazy that I was here. We got Master John within seconds of hearing the news because when a mother hears that something happens to one of their children, you you go into a little bit of a shock. Right. And so to have all of that happen just one after another after another and to know that he was in Master John's hands while he was out because he was totally out the entire time. He didn't wake up until the next morning. Wow. Yeah. One more question for you. Yeah. Did you believe in miracles before Master John came into your life? I was looking for my spirituality, for God, for the angels, for 10 years at least, really for all my life. I would walk into every cathedral, every church, by every rosary, looking and looking for it. It wasn't until I met Master John that it became real, that I could see the miracles, that I could see the light around him, he was doing a healing once and I saw the rays, the golden rays moving right out of his hands into another lady. I mean, I don't see, but it just, I just happened that way. So he, Master John has made God and the angels real. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you to all who shared those eight miracle stories in this episode. I wanted to highlight that last miracle with Kathy's son in the car accident. That miracle happened while both Kathy and Master John Douglas were in Boone, North Carolina. Kathy's son, however, was several states away while Master John and the angels did remote healing for him. And I want to reiterate what Kathy said, that Master John's blessings reach into our entire family, whether our family members have seen Master John or not. In this case, Kathy's son had never been to see Master John, and as far as I know, I don't think he ever has been since. Yet, he still received instant attention from him after his car accident. Remote healing is something near and dear to my heart. I've had a practice that is primarily remote energy healing for a few years now, in which I also incorporate Master John's angelic healing work. And even though I have both facilitated and benefited from lots of remote healings, it still amazes me every time. I do believe this kind of healing is a big part of the future of modern medicine, and I am excited to see how that plays out. In this week's bonus content, I'm going to be sharing a few of my own experiences using silent faith remote healings and karmic mitigation blessings. To catch this, tune in at www.patreon.com slash let's get meta. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash let's get meta. If you want to learn more about SFRs or KMBs, please visit masterangels.org. If you want to hear some more about how remote healing works, please listen to episode 17 of this podcast, Distant Healing with Cherry Lee Ward. Cherry Lee is this amazing healer, and this is a great episode, and we talk about distance healing, which we both do and have had done for us. If you are enjoying the Let's Get Metaphysical podcast, please consider subscribing to the podcast for free. Give us a five-star rating or write us a good review. Reviews are gold, so if you're feeling it, please write one on Apple Podcasts now. You can like us on Facebook or follow us on Instagram. Share Let's Get Meta with your friends. We want this high vibe content to reach as many aligned ears as possible. 
and your likes, stars, reviews, and shares can help make that happen. I'm going to leave it there for today. Thank you for listening. Stay healthy, stay safe, and stay meta. The statements and advice offered in this podcast are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or medical condition, and are not substitutes for prudent medical care offered by a licensed medical professional. References to healing or treatments in this podcast are describing faith-based blessings performed by God and the master healing angels. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you like what we are doing, please consider becoming a patron of the podcast at patreon.com slash let's get meta. Our intention is to raise the vibration of the planet by sharing, validating, and normalizing spiritual and metaphysical experiences. If you haven't pledged yet, we would really appreciate your support. It helps keep this show going. Let's Get Metaphysical is a production of the HANA Healing Arts Network. The show's host is Renata Maniachi. The music for this podcast was composed by Rob Trefort of goldenturtlesound.org. Thank you for listening. Stay meta. Metaphysical.